Well, thank you so much for having me here this evening, and it was a special pleasure uh, to come here when I saw that one of the uh, sponsors was LA Jews for Peace. It was a special incentive for me uh, because I knew it would make the possibility for a fruitful exchange of opinions after I uh, finished presenting my remarks. So I'm prepared to stay all night. I have an early flight, but I'm not sure if I should use the expression here, God willing, but hopefully we'll be able to have a long and useful evening. Uh, the topic I'm going to be speaking on this evening is actually the title of a book I'm working on now with the Palestinian political analyst uh, Moeen Rabani. Uh, the title of the book and also the, the ostensible topic for this evening's talk is how to solve the Israel-Palestine conflict. Uh, now, for most of my adult life when I've been lecturing on this topic, I saw it as my primary responsibility, my primary obligation to basically clarify the documentary record, the actual record in the conflict, because it had been so egregiously distorted by the mainstream media and also by a lot of mainstream scholarship. Uh, so basically what I did was pretty elementary. I would first, on one side, uh, run through what the claims that the claims that are made about how the conflict originated and what's going on now, and then juxtapose the claims against what the documentary record actually shows. Uh, and as you can imagine, there used to be at any rate a huge chasm separating the actual record from the way it's distilled. Uh, in the public media, and as I said, a large part of mainstream scholarship. Uh, but that's no longer the case, in my opinion. I think among the broad audience, among the broad public, uh, there is a reasonable understanding of the conflict uh, and its true dimensions, its actual, its realities. It doesn't mean the broad public knows all the details, uh, but the broad public, I think, has a much clearer picture about what's going on there and also what's happened in the, what happened in the past. Uh, a broad enough understanding, a clear enough understanding that it's now time to speak about how to solve the conflict. And that's what I would like to address today. Uh, not only because I think people have grown weary and bored of hearing the gory details, and most people I think know enough of the gory details that they don't need to know more, uh, but also because I think uh, there is a real opportunity now, there's a possibility for resolving the conflict and finally uh, removing it from the pages of current events and placing it where it rightfully belongs, namely into the history books. There's no certainty that a resolution is within reach. I wouldn't even say there is a probability, but I certainly do believe there is a possibility that the conflict can actually be resolved. Uh, now, in order for us to achieve a resolution of the conflict, it requires, I think, extreme clarity on both the ends, what we desire, the goals, and also the means to achieve those ends. Uh, unfortunately, for many reasons, and perhaps during questions and answers, uh, we'll have time to discuss it. Uh, I think there has been a vast proliferation of sheer nonsense about what the proper goals should be. And there's also, I think, a lot of misunderstanding about what the proper means are to try to achieve the ends. Uh, as I said, I think there are many reasons for that, this uh, proliferation of nonsense. Uh, and I'll have, hopefully, time to run through it with you after my remarks are complete. So, my order of business today is twofold. First of all, I want to suggest why I think it's possible now. I think there are realistic possibilities now for resolving the conflict. Uh, basically, what has changed? And secondly, then to look at, okay, then what would a resolution look like? What would be the terms? 
for solving the conflict. Uh, so let me begin with the beginning, namely, well, what has changed? Why is it, uh, why, are why are there now realistic possibilities uh, for achieving the conflict, unlike uh, even in the recent past? Uh, basically, you would have to look, I think, at three dimensions. First of all, changes in the regional balance of forces, meaning in the Middle East, uh, changes on the international scene, and also, critically, uh, changes in the American scene. Let me start with the regional changes. Um, Israel, historically, Israel's major ally in the Muslim world was Turkey, and its major ally in the Arab world, at least since the late 1970s, has been Egypt. And in both those cases, both Turkey and Egypt, there have been significant shifts in power. It doesn't mean there has been, so to speak, a break in relations between the U.S. And, excuse me, between Israel and Turkey, or between Israel and, the, uh, and Egypt. That's obviously not true. Uh, but there has been significant changes, both basically because, uh, in both cases, in the case of Turkey and in the case of G Egypt, uh, governments, regimes have come into power, which are both ideologically more sympathetic to the Palestinians and also because of their popular base. Uh, they have to defer to Palestinian sensibilities in ways in which uh, the pre previous governments did not. As I said, one shouldn't overestimate the changes, but on the other hand, I think it would be a mistake to be too cynical and underestimate the significance of the changes. So let me take one concrete example. Uh, as everybody in this room knows, in 2008, 2009, uh, Israel invaded Gaza and the course of what Amnesty International called the 22 days of death and destruction. Israel killed about 1,400 Palestinians, about up to 1,200 of those 1,400 were civilians, and basically uh, wrecked and destroyed everything in sight. By the end of those 22 days, Israel had left behind 600,000 tons of rubble. Almost immediately after that first assault on Gaza, what Israel called Operation Cast Lead, uh, the talk began in Israel about launching another attack. They were calling Operation Cast Lead 2. And they were saying it over and over and over again, but nothing happened until November 2012, not so long ago when Israel launched another attack on Gaza. And that attack lasted about eight days, uh, not in any way to minimize the death and destruction that Israel inflicted in the last attack. It was very different than the first one. Uh, it was about 170 uh, Gazans were killed, not nearly the magnitude of destruction uh, and also, at the end, Israel wasn't able to launch the ground invasion in order to subdue the people of Gaza. And the basic reason, there are several, but the one I want to focus on now, uh, one of the basic reasons that invasion looked very different was not nearly the magnitude of destruction of uh, what happened in 2008-9, was because Turkey and Egypt both made clear to President Obama they transmitted the message to Obama that we too, meaning Turkey and Egypt, that we too have our red lines and that you're not going to carry, Israel will not carry on in Gaza the way it did in 2008-9. Uh, and that firstly limited the uh, magnitude of destruction, but even more critically, it prevented Israel from launching that ground invasion. Uh, because Israeli society can fairly easily absorb civilian casualties, but it can't really absorb combatant casualties. The only way you can uh, launch a ground invasion into Gaza with a bare minimum of combatant casualties in 2008-9 was 10 combatant casualties, and of those 10, four were as a result of friendly fire, Israelis accidentally shooting other Israeli soldiers. Uh, the only way you can have that kind of limited number of combatant casualties, 
Well, in 2008-9, the only way they were able to pull it off is they blasted everything in sight. And that was the orders to the soldiers going into Gaza. Anything this way, that way, that way, or that way for a mile around, just level it, don't ask any questions. Uh, because they wanted to prevent the combatant casualties. This time they couldn't do that. Uh, the Egyptians and Turkish, the Turks made clear, you're not going to carry on again. You're not going to do what you did in 2008-9. And so Israel wasn't able to launch the ground invasion. And at the end of the eight days, Israel suffered a major military defeat. Uh, most, some of you may have seen the scenes when the Israelis were forced uh, to uh, end the invasion. Uh, the people of Gaza poured into the streets. It was sort of like a mass wedding party. And the Israelis held a news conference. Uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu, uh, Defense Minister Ehud Barak, and um, Foreign Minister Avigdor Lieberman. And you saw the news conference. It was like three Huckleberry Finns attending their own funeral. It was not a pretty sight for them. So uh, now there do exist. Again, we shouldn't exaggerate, but we also shouldn't underestimate. There do exist now some real limitations uh, because of the changes in power in that area of the world. There now exists some real limitations in the power on the uh, uh, resort to indiscriminate violent force uh, that Israel uh, can uh, deploy uh, in the course of its periodic invasions and periodic uh, assaults uh, on, re on countries in the region. So uh, those are just an indication of some of the changes at the regional level. Uh, internationally, Israel's stock has uh, plummeted in the past 10 years, and each day it actually gets worse and worse for Israel in terms of its public image and also governmental action at the international level. To take a typical example, uh, every year the BBC World Service publishes a survey it's, uh, where they ask about uh, people from 36 countries uh, to this, uh, to this uh, rank whether this country, country A, country B, uh, whether they exercise basically a positive impact in world affairs or a negative impact in world affairs. And every year in this survey, since about 2002, every year in this survey, there are four countries all the way at the bottom, basically in the category all on their own. Four countries are clustered, which according to public opinion around the world, exercise an overwhelmingly negative impact on world affairs. Three of the four countries, everybody in this room can pretty much figure out on their own. So the Islamic Republic of Iran, uh, notwithstanding um, uh, President Ahmadinejad's smile and his wardrobe, uh, he always ends up at the, uh, Iran always ends up at the bottom of the heap. Uh, North Korea, as you can imagine, doesn't do very well in public opinion, uh, and neither for that matter does Pakistan. So Pakistan, North Korea, and the Islamic Republic of Iran, they're always at the bottom in the category all their own. Uh, the fourth country that's always in that cluster uh, is Israel. Uh, and that's quite surprising on two levels. Uh, first of all, that Israel would be in the company of North Korea, Pakistan, and the Islamic Republic of Iran, so far as public opinion around the world is concerned. But there's also a second interesting aspect of that. Uh, namely, uh, this is a fairly heterogeneous group, uh, both in terms of ethnic background, religious background, and also in terms of age. Uh, notwithstanding the heterogeneity of the group, I'm quite secure in making the claim that I very much doubt, or I'm certain, that there is not a single person in this room who has ever read a favorable article about North Korea uh, in their newspaper or press. Well, it's possible you worked for The Guardian, as I did in the 1970s. We actually were fans of Kim Il-sung, but OK. Um, but that can't really be said about Israel, you know, depending on the country in the United States, Canada, Germany, Australia, 
Israel gets excellent press. Uh, in other countries, they get half and half, and in other countries, they get a very negative press. But notwithstanding the fact that media coverage of Israel is quite heterogeneous, media coverage of North Korea is homogeneous, um, notwithstanding that, the public sees right through the lies, right through the deceptions, right through the misrepresentations, and the public places Israel squarely in the same category as um, uh, same category as North Korea in terms of its impact on world affairs. Uh, most recently, the, um, when the Palestinian made its bid for statehood in the United Nations, the vote was 138 to 9, 41 abstentions. Uh, what was interesting was the Europeans this time, they split on the question. Usually they go along with the United States. But this time, uh, countries as diverse as France, Spain, Belgium, Norway, the Netherlands, Austria, and Denmark, uh, they all voted for Palestinian statehood. If you look at Israel, uh, the U.S.'s and the Israel's strongest, uh, strongest allies, there too you noticed movement. The U.K., which routinely backs anything the U.S. says when it comes to Israel-Palestine, this time the U.K. abstained. Germany, under the leadership of Merkel, who's semi-insane uh, on this question, Merkel still thinks it's World War II when she's the member of a commando unit that's going to kill Hitler in his bunker. She doesn't quite know the war is over already, and Hitler is dead, Angela. Uh, this time, surprisingly, uh, Germany abstained. It didn't vote with the U.S. Israel's most reflexive ally in the United Nations is uh, almost always Australia. Uh, this time, Australia abstained. Uh, so there's been uh, sometimes subtle, sometimes quiet, but nonetheless, there has been significant movement uh, with Israel and the United States being progressively more isolated. Um, most recently, countries like the Netherlands, which have been very forceful allies of uh, Israel, even as far back as 1967, uh, during the uh, deliberations in the UN General Assembly, uh, Netherlands is changing now. Netherlands is firmly in favor of marking um, uh, the products coming from the uh, Israeli settlements uh, and uh, not banning them, but clearly stating that these are illegal products and warning uh, consumers on that account. Uh, so, uh, and the G Europeans in general, some of you have been following the recent news, the Europeans in general are taking a much more aggressive position on the question of the settlements and the settlement products. Uh, and that leaves us with, obviously, the most important factor, namely the United States. In the case of the United States, there have been significant changes. There have been also, it's fluctuating. Uh, I don't want to pretend that there are no polls which show that the American relationship with Israel is stronger than ever. Yeah, there are some poll results that show that. But overall, I think the poll, uh, I, go through, I go through a huge number of the poll data uh, in the last book I wrote. Um, uh, knowing too much. Overall, the poll data shows that Israel's stock is uh, falling in the United States. Uh, take the example of the BBC World Service poll. Uh, the question of do you think this country has had a favorable or an unfavorable impact in world affairs? Uh, the last poll, which was 2011, it was quite surprising. 48% uh, of Americans said positive impact, but for the first time ever, 47% said negative impact. The American public was almost divided right down the middle on that question. Uh, and there are many other indications, but for the purposes of this evening, I think I'm going to focus on the question of American Jews in Israel, the subdivision, not Americans in general, but American Jews in Israel. And there you can see there have been some significant changes. Uh, and the more interesting question is, uh, why? And my own opinion, which I attempt to document uh, in the book, is that American Jews, as everybody in this room knows, and one of the reasons probably half this audience is Jewish, 
uh, is because American Jews are overwhelmingly liberal. Uh, they always have been, or I should say not always, but they have been since the 1930s. Um, the American Jews have consistently voted Democratic and consistently voted, uh, expressed opinions at the liberal end of the uh, political spectrum with uh, some uh, reser uh, with some uh, uh, reservations, but in general, their their opinions on social topics have been consistently uh, liberal. Uh, and you take the example of 2008, the presidential election, American Jews voted, depending on the exit poll, between 75% and 80% of American Jews voted for Barack Obama, which was, apart from African Americans, there was no other ethno-religious group in the United States who came even near. Uh, and the uh, Latinos was about 63% voted for Obama. So that's a striking fact in itself. After African Americans, American Jews were, by a wide margin, the biggest supporters of Barack Obama. But what made it even more surprising is, well, American Jews are by a far and away the wealthiest ethno-religious group in the United States. So if you're the wealthiest ethno-religious group in the United States by a wide margin, you should be voting for the Rich People's Party, the Republican Party. But American Jews do not. Notwithstanding their wealth, they vote consistently Democratic. In fact, in 2008, uh, many more American Jews vote for Obama than Latinos, and Latinos are among the poorest uh, ethnic groups in the United States. There was an even more, so you might call it, laboratory test uh, in 2012, because here we had a case of the Prime Minister of Israel actively campaigning against President Obama, saying in effect that Mr. Obama was bad for Jews and bad for Israel. So if you were to accept the thesis that Jews vote reflexively on the basis of ethnicity, and if you accept the fact that Jews reflexively vote for Israel because of that ethnic bond, you would expect that since Mr. Uh, Netanyahu, the Prime Minister of Israel, was saying Obama is bad for Israel, bad for the Jews, vote for Romney. American Jews would vote for Romney. That would be the reasonable inference if you accept the uh, premises that Jews vote on, ethnic, uh, vote on ethnic grounds and they have a kind of blood loyalty to Israel. But that's just not what happened. Notwithstanding um, President Prime Minister Netanyahu's preferences, 70% uh, of American Jews voted for Obama, roughly in the same trajectory as past elections, somewhat less, but that was typical, because people in general uh, had soured on Obama. Uh, I think this time Latinos voted in larger numbers for him, uh, but that was because of a very particular issue. The Republicans were lunatic on the immigration question, uh, and so they lost the whole Latino population. But in general, uh, American Jews show themselves to be among, if not the most stalwart supporters, uh, apart from African Americans, of the, um, of the uh, Democratic Party and the liberal end of the spectrum. Uh, the polls also show, because the exit polls pose some other questions to American Jews, American Jews overwhelmingly support Obama's stand on Iran as compared to the Romney-Netanyahu stand. And American Jews overwhelmingly support Obama's stand on Israel as compared to Romney's fanatically pro-Israel stance.